Hi, um, my name is Derek and I'm your instructor for our machine learning course. Um, and this video we're looking at uh, materials from chapter 4 of our textbook that we're using, the hands-on machine learning textbook. Um, so we've kind of got uh, two topics here, but they kind of go well together. So uh, polynomial regression and we're going to look at learning curves. So um, we'll talk um, about polynomial regression a little bit, polynomials, kind of review those. Um, but um, somewhat surprising the first time you see this is that you can actually use the linear regression, the, the general framework that we talked about, to fit um, uh, a, a nonlinear relationship. Okay, so we'll show you how you can do that here. Um, and uh, the way we do that, um, um, so we can do that by hand by adding polynomial features. Um, um, using like a framework or, or, or we could do it ourselves. So we can use scikit-learn to do this. Um, and then we're going to talk about learning curves, okay? So so this is a general tool that we'll be using over and over again for um, all the stuff that we do in this class. So we'll talk a little bit about the concepts of underfitting and overfitting of a model, uh, learn how to generate these learning curves, and then um, learn how to read them basically for de for trying to determine whether your model may be underfitting or overfitting or is just right or sort of the Goldilocks kind of principle. All right, so um, currently I've got this named um, uh, 04 part 3, um, but um, yeah, this is the sections um, like 4.3 and 4.4 from chapter 4 of our HLML textbook. Um, All right, so first of all, um, I mean, you know, just um, kind of a review. When, when we talk about a polynomial, we mean something of the form, um, and, and when we talk about the degree of a polynomial, we, we mean something of the form like, um, uh, so this is a, an example of a degree two polynomial. So it has a like ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, you can extend that that concept to any degree you want. So a de degree five polynomial would be would have terms ax to the fifth plus bx to the fourth plus cx cubed. Right, you got that. So it, where you know the a b c d as I'm kind of just saying them out loud here represent parameters, and so you know when you give specific values to those parameters, you're going to get a certain. If I could just jump down here, you're going to get a certain shape to your curve. Well, I got to I got to run the, the these uh, cells here so um, before I can show it. So so yeah, the, I mean this is our degree two polynomial. So so a, a quadratic polynomial will basically give you a, a parabola, right? So so we're just showing part of the parabola from negative three to three, and that's just specifically for a is one half, b is three fourths, and c is three. Okay. But um, you know you should kind of understand the general concept, uh, and and we can extend this to degree four, degree five, and and keep going for as many degrees as we want for a general polynomial. But it always just has terms of one variable raised to some power, right? Okay, so somewhat surprisingly, the first time uh, people run across this is is so, so in the previous lecture, we looked at fitting a line to a data, and, and we said, you know, that basically only works if the, the the data you're trying to model has some sort of linear relationship, right? So clearly, this data here that we generated uh, by hand here, so it's just some random data, but 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 the points, the blue points, are data. So maybe I should explain this a little more. So so we're, so we're using this degree two polynomial, a quadratic equation. Um, and these are the true parameters that that um, that um, govern the the relationship of x one and y of, for this data, right? Um, but but like we did before, we added a little bit of noise. So we've got a little bit of Gaussian noise with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So so these things tend to be plus or minus about 0.5 approximately um, within 0.5 most of the time, right? Um, so yeah, the, the red line is the true function, so without any noise, the actual quadratic function that governs this system um, is this. So, so even, even if you remove that red line, I mean, it would still be pretty clear this is not 
um, a linear relationship for the data. So a straight line model would, would probably not be a very good model of the data, right? If, if, if you saw this, you know, especially because, I mean, it looks like it has a negative slope through this part of the, um, the data and a positive slope over here, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it, sometimes it's not so clear when, when you have real data like this, but, but this, this is an example of something that you would probably clearly say, um, you know, th there's, there's something nonlinear with the relationship between um, X and Y there. Um, so, okay, and then by the way, you know, uh, we've used the polyfit before, so polyfit can also fit, um, you know, more than just a degree one or a linear relationship. So you can, if 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 you suspect it's a quadratic, you can try and fit um, a degree two um, polynomial to it, right, and see what kind of a fit you get. So uh, oh, here we we print it out. So this was a b. This was the estimate of a b and c. So again, because of the noise, you won't get a, a perfect model, but, uh, but you can see it's pretty close because A was one half, B was three fourths, point seven five, and, and C, the, the bias, you can still think of this as a bias term, right? So it's, it's the term that you're not multiplying by any power of the um, independent variable X here. So these are still an independent variable and our dependent variable Y that depends on um, the value of X, right? So yeah, you know, so, so if you use that, so we're going to show, so the, the kind of the same thing that polyfit is doing, so, so we can do by hand, right? Um, or, or we can use scikit-learn to, um, to, to fit. And, and we can use it using the same um, cost function and the same method that we developed um, in our previous video, all right? So how do you do that? Well, the, the general tr technique works like this. So... Um, Imagine instead of just a single uh, feature, x1, uh, we think of having two features, x1 and x2, but think of x2 feature as being related to x1. It's just the square of x1, okay? So, so if, you, if you plug that back in there, you'll see that, that that rewrites this equation as we only have x1, one feature, you know, like, like we did for our fit, like we've done for our fit and cost function uh, in the previous um, video. Um, so it's, it's theta 1 times x1 plus theta 2 times x1 squared, right? But, you know, if you do that, if, if you just um, um, make a, um, you know, add some additional polynomial combinations of your x1 feature, you know, and again, you could extend this. Uh, I could also add an x cubed uh, feature x to the fourth to make it a, a higher degree polynomial that, that I want to fit, okay? But but that's the general idea. So if I add in an x squared, I can try and fit uh, a quadratic using the, the mean squared uh, error cost function and a, a simple linear regression, you know, where, where we um, um, uh, use our cost function to find the values of theta zero, theta one, and theta two in this case that minimize that cost, and in this case, that minimized the cost for a degree two, a quadratic polynomial fit. All right. So you know, uh, you can't really do this using the the normal equation, exact equation, because it does th that method does depend on the um, um, function you're trying to fit being uh, linear, right? Because of because of how you derive the equation, but you can use this perfectly fine with an optimization method like gradient descent, right? So as long as you just add in the extra feature terms of the higher degree polynomial that that you think you want to fit there, the gradient descent optimization is is, is happy then to find theta zero, theta one, theta two that will minimize the cost um, and give you a higher degree fit for your function, all right? Um, yeah, and, and, you know, it's, it's not all that tough to add, you know, so, so if, if I have my data like I had bef before with just my X1 feature, um, I can certainly add another column, like, a, you know, by hand using NumPy or, or, or like Pandas to add another column where you just square the X1 column and, and, and append a new column onto the end, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Scikit-Learn has a specific... Um, method as part of its framework that uh, allows you to do a, a fit transform 
kind of a thing, you know, right? So the way the, the polynomial features works, um, if, if you tell it a degree 2 and you give it uh, an array, so in this case we're going to give it an array with just uh, the one feature, x1, th this one here. So for, for degree 2, it's going to return a new array. So our original array was, was of shape 100 by 1 of, of the data, and it just had the, the x1 feature. Now, um, when you do a um, fit transform on, on this polynomial features object with x, it will, for degree 2, it will give you uh, now a second column, which is just the square of the first column. So if you look closely, um, so like, I mean, this is almost 1, so 1 squared would be 1, right? Or this is like a negative 3, um, so negative 3 squ um, squared would be um, uh, 9, right? So, but, it, but you can see, that, I mean, basically this, the second column is just the square of the first one, right? Um, and, um, and uh, yeah, so I don't plot this out again, but if you, um, if you use scikit-learn framework to then perform a linear regression fit on the, um, the, this, this new array x that has the, uh, the x squared feature in there, you'll see you get the same thing as, as the polyfit function, okay? So these should have been exactly the same values that we just got um, with our, our polyfit. So 0.5 for the, although they're in a different order, all right? So, so, point, um, so, so 3 was the bias term, so that was the one that's not being multiplied by any of the features x1 or 2 or, or x1 and x1 squared, all right? And, and then this was our x squared feature, was, was x2, right? And then uh, x1 was the, um, um, the original feature before we squared it, right? Um, so, oh, and, and then one more fe uh, uh, note about the polynomial features is that, uh, yeah, I mean, you can use it for even higher degree of polynomials, okay? And the other thing to realize about that, though, is that it's uh, a polynomial, so I've only done it with one feature, x or x1, but um, this will work f also fine if you have multiple original features. Let's say you have x1 and x2, or actually in this case we call it a and b, right? So, so if I originally had a and b and I asked for a, a degree 3 uh, polynomial, it'll give you all the, the ones you would expect. So you'd get the a squared and the b squared and the a cubed and the b cubed, but you also get the, 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 um, the, the combinations of the a and b as well. So you'll get a, b, you'll get uh, a squared, b, a, b squared, right? So, so all possible... Uh, powers of a and b plus also all combinations of a b up to degree three for this example right so if you look at it, the, the original array was um, a, a 10 by 2 uh, where all the values were just randomly generated between between negative 7 and 7 right so so the first two columns were the original um, so then yeah if you look at it, uh, it it ends up coming out in this order so so this this new one that adds the a squared term so it's just the negative six squared um, and then this one is a b so it's negative six times six in this case and and so on you can uh, check that that's for yourself so but um, yeah so so polynomial features is, is you know pretty powerful convenient to, if, if, if you wanted to generate so so it still it wouldn't be too tough to generate this by hand if you wanted to but uh, so you can imagine like a degree ten or a degree hundred polynomial um, you know that that's a lot of work to get all the including all the combinations especially if you have more than like two features like if you had a hundred features and you wanted to generate uh, you know the the degree hundred um, that greatly so that that's one of the the um, now that I'm thinking about it, so I'll just mention, so so doing this kind of uh, polynomial regression has a big drawback in that the uh, the, the features uh, um, um, grow exponentially uh, with the number of original features that you have, right? So if you, I wanted to do a degree 100 polynomial and I have 100 features, I, it's not 100 times 100, it's, it's a lot more than that if you work out the number of features that you would get, right? So, so it'll greatly, exp it'll quickly explode how big your, um, you know, the number of columns are, the number of features that you have that you're trying to fit if, if you're doing this, so. Um, all right, so that, that was a little bit about um, fitting a higher order degree uh, model to a set of data. So uh, learning curves, um, so we're going to use those, those uh, 
polynomial, so fitting a polynomial here um, in our discussion. Um, so, but, but learning curves are um, um, a tool that we're going to use a lot in this class. Um, so, so yeah, let's, let's just jump right into the example, okay? So, so learning, learning curves are a way to try and determine how well your model is performing, but not only how well, but, but to determine um, what's going wrong with it if, if, it's, if it's not doing well. So there's, there's particular ways that a machine, machine learning model can um, underperform or fail to work, right? And, and learning curves help you uh, determine that, all right? So later on, I got some cells here that are going to take a, a while to um, um, calculate. So I'll probably have to pause the video. But um, let, let's create the, again the same data. So, so we're going to make up our data again. It has a quadratic relationship. So the, the true relationship is still this quadratic, the same one with uh, you know 0.5 times x squared plus uh, th one half x squared, three fourths x plus three, right? And and a little bit of noise added in, right? Now let's fit. So, so here, you know, we're going to fit um, a, a line to it. So, but we know it's not a linear. So, but we'll we'll fit a line, and we'll fit a degree two polynomial, so a quadratic, right? Um, and you know, this um, is the the true relationship is quadratic. So, so we're fitting quadratic. But we'll also fit a degree three hundred polynomial. Okay. So in this case, since there's only one feature, we end up with an array with three hundred. Um, Columns. If if you look at the the shape of um, of x degree three hundred here, right? So, um, uh, oops, um, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, I cut that. Um, there we go. <laughs> so. Um, So yeah, the, the the x degree 300 um, is um, has 300 columns, right? From the original one column. Okay. So let's um, and and uh, yeah, we already fit the each one of these to the model using a linear regression. So um, if you plot. What you get for that, uh, you get something like this, right? So here, the you know the, the raw data points with noise are the the the, the dots. Um, the red line is our um, straight line linear fit degree one polynomial. The blue line is the quadratic uh, degree two fit, right? And the green line is the degree three hundred polynomial fit, right? So. <coughs> I didn't measure it here, maybe I should have, um, but which one do you think, if you measure the cost, the resulting cost on the original data you trained with, which one do you think will have the smallest cost, um, right? You should take a moment and think about that, right? You should be able to answer, I mean, you should see that the degree 300 polynomial is going through many more of these points than either of the other ones. So if you actually went and measured the cost on the data you trained with, the, the, the cost for the degree 300 polynomial would be much less than the other two, right? Probably the, um, the degree 2 polynomial then would be uh, a little bit better than the degree 1 because um, it's able to get a little bit closer to more of the points than the other one, than, than our linear fit, right? So the um, the the point of this though is is so d does the the question then is the 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 model that has the the smallest cost on the data that you trained with does that mean it's the best model right and the whole point of this figure which is kind of an important one uh, important concept is is no you know it, it's it's definitely not right the 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 you know, and, and I could do even better if I could go to 500 degrees or 1,000 degrees, right? I, I, eventually, I could push this to get the cost to pretty much zero because I, I could make it wiggle and squirm and go through every possible point if I just give enough degrees of freedom. So this is kind of what is meant by degrees of freedom in statistics. That, that's the power of your model. But if you give enough degrees of freedom, you can always perfectly fit a set of data. But the point is, is that just because you fit the data you see 
that doesn't mean you're going to be it's going to be a model that's going to predict well new data that you've never seen before because the true relationship is a quadratic here right right so if i generate some new points and 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 calculate the cost um, of the predictions for those new points the 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 degree of 300 polynomial is going to start failing miserably especially where it's really wiggling down here at the end so so any data that we generate out here that wasn't in the original data set is going to badly misjudge because it's going to actually be somewhere around down here you know which is our true quadratic relationship and the model is going to be predicting these really large values for these things right so um so, so yeah, I mean, the, the power of your model, like the, the degrees of freedom, does not guarantee you, you're going to end up with a good model, right? Because a good model generalizes and can predict on data that you haven't trained with, okay? So really, a good model depends on actually capturing the, the true type of the function that's generating the, the data, right? So you don't want to capture the noise, but you want to capture the, the, the kind of relationship of the, the, between the independent variables or features and the de dependent one, right? And that's a lot tougher to do because you, you can't, you, you, you don't really know, right, what might be governing your model. That's, that's kind of when you're really doing science. Now, unlike this example where we, we know what the true function is that's, that's generating this data, you know, you don't know that for like real natural phenomenon that you might be trying to um, study, all right? Okay, so uh, learning curves then are a tool that we can use to help us figure out whether we are overfitting or underfitting, okay? So in this particular case, the linear model is probably going to be underfitting, underperforming because it's, it's not quite powerful enough. Okay, so, so you can do better by, by using a higher degree because the um, true relationship of the data um, is is nonlinear, right? But um, the 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 degree three hundred is overfitting, right? Um, so we'd like to have a tool that we could kind of differentiate between these two and, and determine if something is underfitting or over because you can't know that from real data. You know, so, so you won't be given or have an idea of what the true relationship is of, of the data that you're trying to model with a machine learning method or statistical model. Um, so here, and, and yeah, like I said, some of these cells next will take some time to do. Um, we're going to use the same relationship, although I'm, I'm greatly expanding our data set, so it'll make the... the um, um, illustration of this much clearer here of, of how these learning curves work. So basically a learning curve um, um, and uh, you can redo this function. So we reuse this function. So, so this function given uh, a, a scikit-learn model and the data we want to fit to uh, will actually perform um, a um, cross-validation fit for uh, the model where it holds back, it starts by holding back, um, uh, training it with one data point and then cross validating it on all of the r remaining 9,999, 9, right? Um, and then it trains it with two data points um, and validates it with the others and so on up to 10,000, okay? So that's basically what a learning curve is, right? Um, so um, if we do that, if we look at for the linear regression, so this is, remember, the, the linear regression is an example of something that's probably going to be underfitting. Um, and if you plot this, uh, and, and so I'll be able to, so this one doesn't take so long, but uh, when you get to the degree 300 polynomial, it might take some time. But this is what you get, okay? So um, so here we're, tra we're, we're plotting both the performance in terms of the, the cost, the final cost, on the that it did with the training data and with the validation data. And, and in this case, um, this is when we trained with uh, one only one piece of data initially and then with two pieces and then so on up to when we trained with the whole set here, right? Oh, sorry, we only, we only show up to 1,000 even though there's 10,000 points. So, so we, we do cross-validation training where, where, the, where the training set size is one, two, three, up to 1,000 of the 10,000 data points here, okay? Um, you can get the same 
exact, exact kind of um, learning curve when you do gradient descent. So we're not really doing gradient descent here. We're using the the linear regret. We're using the um, optimization method that's built into Scikit-Learn's linear regression, um, right? Um, and we're using cross-validation. So, but when you use gradient descent, you get a similar kind of thing by by looking at the training and the validation uh, cost uh, after training for like one epoch and two epochs and, and so on, right? So, so either way, you, you can do the same determination. So, um, so here, this is typical for an, an underperforming, uh, an underfitted model. Um, So both both curves reach a plateau that are fairly close to each other uh, when it's underfitting, but the plateau, uh, you know, we'll see later on, is is uh, a lot higher than what you can ch achieve with this particular data set. Okay, so again, I mean, the real the, the thing that you're ultimately in interested in is how well it does on the validation data. So so the data that was not trained with, right? So and, and so notice and, and also this is expected. So you expect if you only train with one or two pieces of data, and, and then this curve is the um, the the calculations of the cost only on that data you trained with, right? So when you only have a, a few, you know, like like when you only have two points, of course you can fit those perfectly with a straight line. It'll go through those two points, and you'll have zero error. So that's why it starts off at zero for the first few. But then once you get you know three or four points, uh, you can't get a perfect fit, and you're going to have some error. Um, but the, the the error will quickly reach a plateau. So the main point though is that if you're underfitting, your validation uh, and and of course the the validation um, error you know is going to be really high initially because um, if you're only training with a few points, um, your prediction is going to be bad. So not until you train with, with, with a sufficient number of points um, are you going to be able to generalize fairly well, right? But but for underfitting models, the, the validation and training will both come together at, at a relatively high cost, right? So, so the validation will... Um, 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 so, so this will be similar to what we'll see in another one. So, so the point is, though, is that while these these end up being similar, what you have to then look at is what level they end up reaching. So, so our cost ended up reaching about like a what 0.18 something for the best cost on the validation data that we could get. All right. So let's look at the overfitting case, right? And, and this one will take some time to train. Um, so yeah, I think I went down to a degree 100 polynomial here, but um, but you'll be able to see the example, right? Um, so I'll go ahead and pause the video um, and then come back once this come once this finishes up. Okay, um, we're done fitting our 300 or our 100 degree uh, polynomial here. Um, so the, the you won't always see exactly the same. So sometimes the, the the validation might never quite close the gap. Okay. So if, if you see this, this is actually illustrating kind of two uh, separate things here. So um, so for one, if if you have learning curves like this where there's a big gap and and you know where big is going to be hard to define, but but so. So, so usually, you know, it's going to look something like this when there's not really much of a gap or where, where they're converging. But, but yeah, if we only looked like to up to 300 or 400 data points, um, uh, the, the, the difference between the cost we're getting on the validation set and the cost we're getting on the training set would have a much bigger of a gap, okay? But those kinds of gaps are indicative of, of overfitting, because you know that, and, and that should make intuitive sense. If, if you're overfitting, you're going to be doing great on the data you trained with, but you're going to do miserable on data you haven't trained with. All right. So, uh, and again, like I said, this won't always happen when you do this. So sometimes this gap will go even for a thousand. But um, the the training set size here is big enough 
that at some point the amount of data you're training with can overcome the overfitting, okay? So this is one of the, the things about using big data, big data sets, because big data sets, no matter how powerful your model is, if you've got enough data, um, your, your, your model is just not going to be powerful enough to overfit it if that makes sense, right? So, so, at some, so, so big data can um, be one of the fixes for overfitting a model. When you have truly big data sets, you, just, you often want to just throw as big and powerful a model as you can afford to computationally, um, and, and the, the bigness of the data set will uh, eventually uh, get it to a point where um, um, it negates any overfitting that it's able to do, right? And, and you'll get your best performance, okay? So the, the other thing, when, when you detect overfitting, um, the, the, the level that you achieve on the training data um, gives you an idea of, a better idea of what might be possible to achieve uh, for your generalization, for, for your, you know, on, on data you haven't seen. It, get, it gives you a better idea of, of what might be possible in terms of the error of the, uh, the, 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 the sum of the error than for an underfitted model, okay? So, so normally what you want to do is, is you want to get a model that's overfitting so you can see what level your, uh, you get in terms of your cost on the training data, and then that level, that, that, that level of your cost function uh, that you can achieve when you're overfitting on training data uh, is, is what you want to shoot for to try and, and uh, get for, for your validation data, right? For, for, uh, for the performance on data that you haven't seen before, okay? Um, so I'll talk more about that in just a second here. So, so let's just go ahead and, and, and finish this up, um, and uh, let's look at um, what what the learning curves look like for a degree two polynomial. So, and again, in this case, we know that this is gonna this is really the best model because that's the true nature of the function that's governing the, the generation of this data, the relationship of this data, right? So, you know, you don't, you won't know that for real data, but, um, but here we know this. So here, when, um, when there's no gap, you know, it, it's either you might be underfitting or your model might be doing very good. So the way you kind of differentiate this though, is that if, if you have a version of a model that, that you know is overfitting, uh, you know, versus one that was underfitting. So, so for the uh, uh, underfitting, our cost for our training data was higher, like 0 0.17, 0 0.18, something like that, right? But uh, when we're overfitting, our cost for the data was so. So it's it's underperforming here. Um, so it doesn't get a very good cost. So when you're overfitting, though, this gives you a, a feel for what might be possible if I have a really good fit model. Um, on data I haven't seen before. So, so I'd like to try to get my cost um, for my validation about like that, around 0 0.10. That, that's kind of what this goal is telling me. And that's what you get for the degree two polynomial. So, so here, again, there's no gap, kind of like for the underfitting model, but we've reduced um, our performance on unseen data down to that same level of, or, or about that what we were doing when we were overfitting okay so around the point 0.9 point 0.1 uh, some squared error of the cost right okay to, to, to summarize that to go back through these three so we'll use this tool over and over again right so so you know we've done it with linear regression but any machine learning uh, model uh, we can do the same thing so here, here's the general approach that you use okay so when you're first trying to model something using a machine learning algorithm um, you'll first want to try to to create like a baseline right like um, like you know, figure out what kind of performance you get with uh, random guessing, right? So, so that, that tells you what the accuracy is. And then you want to see what the cost is for that, okay? But then, kind of the first thing you normally want to do is you want to try and build a model that's going to overfit, okay? Because if you overfit, and, and you, you're mostly going to be t detecting overfitting because the, the validation will stay a, a kind of a pretty big gap from, from what you're training, um, uh, 
cost uh, is, so, so what the cost is on the training data versus the cost on validation. So, so if you get a model that's overfitting, that tells you kind of maybe what the level is that you might be able to get for, you know, your validation error uh, for a good, a well-fitting model, right? And then at that point, you start doing, you know, your sort of meta-parameter tuning and stuff to, to try and find things where you um, uh, remove that gap. So, so you're not overfitting and you're getting your validation kind of down to that level where it looks like uh, you ought to be able to get down to for both validation and training um, that you saw with the overfitting uh, of the model, right? So, so that's kind of the general process. So, so no matter what we're using, if we're using an optimization method, uh, we'll be plotting um, epochs instead of um, you know our, our cross validation training set size. But but the idea is the same. So but yeah, for for so no matter what we're doing, linear regression or later on when we're doing support vector machines or k nearest neighbors or trees or whatever, um, that that general approach is is kind of what you do, right? So you, you try and start with a powerful model to give you an idea of your baseline, and then you start doing your meta parameter tuning to get a model that that's not overfitting anymore but that's that the the, the cost um, reaches what you can see for the training um, error cost um, on, on the overfitted model or close to that kind of thing so um, so yeah I mean you know there, there's a couple of different um, that you, know, you should be aware of these different uh, ways that um, so, so there's there's multiple sources of errors for a model. So, so the different things that we do um, um, address these different kinds of, of, of errors, right? So there's, there's going to be irreducible error that you can never get rid of. That's noise, okay? But um, when you're overfitting, that's kind of variance noise. So uh, this, is, this is the kind of error due to um, a model being too powerful. So in that case... You're, you're going to be producing error because you can't generalize well, right? So, so you, you, you're, you're, you're modeling the noise, basically, and not modeling the true relationship. So that's, that's known as variance. Um, um, and, and bias is the, the part of the error due to wrong assumption. So, it, so here, if, if your model is wrong, so if, if you're trying to fit a linear model and, and you've got a, a nonlinear relationship of the system that you're trying to model, you're going to have bias, and you're, you're never going to be able to reduce that until you get a better um, base model that, that's closer to what is truly happening on the phenomenon that you're trying to um, build a model of. Um, okay, so that's it for polynomial regression and learning curves. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot, all this stuff, I keep saying this about Chapter 4, but, but um, all this stuff is very useful. This is all kind of the base stuff, right? So of, of machine learning. So, so hopefully that gives you a flavor, especially kind of the learning curves of, of what the general approach is, you know, when, when you're trying to model a new set of data. So how you can use this tool of learning curves um, uh, to tune your model um, and, and, and get better performance on, you know, on your predictions of data that you haven't seen before. Okay, that's it, um, and I will see you guys in the next video then.